we can admire the sea sitting on the sand endlessly. This silicon wafer has a lot in common with the sand. The purest polysilicon of electronic quality is made of it. Pure silicon was first obtained by the Russian chemist Nikolai Beketov in 1865. I bet he couldn't even assume that in 150 years all electronics around the world would be centered around this semi-metal. But the silicon era is coming to an end. Each new marketing nanometer value is becoming more and more difficult to achieve. The manufacturers resort to using various tricks, like developing multi-chiplet solutions and increasing TDP, while violating their own heat dissipation standards. But it is already abundantly clear that this is a dead end for silicon. So, what's next? Is it possible that the progress in technology will stop in a couple of years, and we will keep adding more and more pluses to the twisted names of process nodes? Of course not. Scientists from all over the world are looking for and already finding other approaches to the creation of computational electronics. It is MK here, and today we will talk about what life will be like after silicon. Okay, I guess I went too far with the epicness in the introduction. New process nodes do still appear. In 2026, TSMC promises us two nanometer chips, and maybe a little earlier, a weird Intel 20A process node will appear. But I'm sure you know it's just marketing. We should not be expecting a qualitative reduction in the transistor size. And the reason here is physics. The minimum gate size of a silicon transistor is 5 nanometers. 5 silicon nanometers are the limit. With a smaller size, it is simply impossible to make a transistor. It will not work as a switch. Electrons will freely tunnel through its channel, ignoring the band gap. In other words, such a transistor will always be on, so the computation magic will not happen. And the smaller the marketing nanometers are, the closer we get to this physical limit and the more significant the tunneling effect becomes, which is bad for computing. Of course, chip makers are trying their best to solve this problem. Thus, you can reduce other parts of transistor, or give the gate the clever shape. For example, shape it like a fin, like in the FinFET technology where transistors are essentially three-dimensional. However, all these tricks have led to the fact that the transistor density in chips has seriously increased, and now, there can be hundreds of billions of tiny switches in a piece of silicon the size of a fingernail, actively releasing heat when working packed close to each other. And dissipating heat from this sandwich is a serious issue. The owners of the last two generations of Ryzen CPUs have already encountered this. The small 7 nanometer chips, even without overclocking, easily reach the temperature of 90 degrees Celsius. You've probably also heard about the latest Snapdragon and Exynos SoCs, which thermal throttle under load due to overheating. And with each new reduction in the transistor size, the problem will only get worse. Looking at all these problems caused by silicon at the end of its life cycle, the question arises, why not just replace this chemical element with something else? After all, it is hardly unique in the periodic table, which already contains more than a hundred elements. That's right, it's not. There is this metal called germanium, from which it is also possible to make semiconductors. What's more, the first transistors in the late 40s were made of this metal. It has three times higher electrical conductivity, less voltage and hence heat loss at the PN transition, and less resistance of the open channel. In general, germanium seems to be better than silicon in semiconductors. But by the 60s, it had been almost completely abandoned. There were three reasons for that. First, this metal is much more expensive and less common than silicon. The latter is almost 30% of the Earth's crust. Silicon is second to oxygen there. Second, germanium has much less thermal stability. That is, when heated, it loses its characteristics faster. Besides, it has problems with oxidation. And third, it has worse thermal conductivity. That is, it is more difficult to remove heat from it than from a silicon chip. All of this has led to the fact that the frequencies of the best germanium chips made couldn't get higher than hundreds of kilohertz. 
for further increase, it was necessary to switch to silicon. The era of pure germanium ended 60 years ago. But we live in the time of advanced alloys and chemical compounds. Remember the T-1000 from Terminator 2? Is it really impossible to modify germanium in such a way that it becomes better than silicon for semiconductors? It turns out it is possible, and such a compound is called germanane. In fact, it's like graphene, only from germanium, a thin monatomic film. Its production is a form of art. First, a layered pie is made of graphene and calcium, after which the latter is washed out with water, which in the process gives off its hydrogen, making germanium bonds stronger and allowing the separation of single layer films of this metal. As it turned out, such films conduct current 10 times better than silicon, and the cooling issues are not of big concern here. But of course, it is still quite far from commercial production. They have learned to create germanane only in laboratories. And so far, there is not a single ready-made chip based on it. However, germanine is not everything. There is another compound, on the basis of which they actually made a semiconductor chip. It is called molybdenum disulfide, aka molybdenite. Now, it is mainly used to make various alloys, but it has excellent semiconductor properties that persist at such tiny sizes where silicon is oxidized to glass. Thus, scientists managed to bring the thickness of molybdenite to 0.65 nanometers with full preservation of semiconductor properties. And, most importantly, it was possible to create a semiconductor photodiode based on it, which is five times more sensitive than silicon. This will allow to create matrices for cameras with even higher photosensitivity in the future. But is there a perfect chemical element that can replace silicon? Yes, it's carbon. It's ironic. The basis of our life can become the basis of our future terminators. Although it must be admitted that in an extremely unusual form. This unusual compound is called carbon nanotubes and represents sheets of graphene that are rolled up. And yes, they are also semiconductors and of atomic thickness. Besides, their electrical conductivity is three times higher than that of silicon. It is noteworthy that on the basis of such carbon nanotubes, it has already been possible to make the first chip with 14,000 transistors. Although its process node is not striking, only about a micrometer, that is, the level of silicon processors of the 80s, still it is a full-fledged chip on which it has already been possible to run a Hello World program. In the future, scientists are planning to reduce the size of nanotubes and thereby create faster and more efficient chips. But this is still a relatively distant future. All of this arouses the question, is there already such a replacement for silicon that anyone can get their hands on? And not just a couple of scientists in large laboratories. Yes, there is. Charging devices with gallium nitride, or GAN. This semiconductor became popular in the 90s. The first white LEDs and some types of blue lasers were made on its basis. Its peculiarity is that it's possible to produce electronics based on it at the same factories where silicon semiconductors are made. But at the same time, gallium nitride has a wider band gap, which allows it to work at higher voltages or less heating than silicon. And this property is very necessary for compact charges where it's actively used. Well, the first approach has been sorted out. You can replace silicon with another element, which is still far from reaching its physical limitations. But there is also a second way, to abandon the CMOS transistors that we're used to and switch to something else. CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor Structure. And the vast majority of modern microcircuits are based on this principle, which was invented back in the 60s. Hence, a logical question. What if we go a completely different way and not give up silicon, but change the very principle of the chip's operation? This approach is similar to the change of processor architectures. For example, Apple has shown that its M1 ARM chips can be both noticeably more powerful and run noticeably cooler than many modern x86 chips from AMD and Intel. Perhaps the rejection of CMOS transistors will do the same. Well, such ideas do exist indeed, not only on paper, 
there exist the so-called tunnel field effect transistors. They work completely differently compared to field effect transistors. If for the latter, electron tunneling is a failure, a transistor cannot get closed and turns into a conductor, the TFET's whole operation principle is based on this effect. The thing is, that tunneling looks like cheating physics. It makes sense that if an electron does not have enough energy to overcome a potential barrier, then it will remain behind it, unless it's given the missing energy. However, a tunneling effect allows electrons, even with insufficient energy, to leak through the barrier. In other words, this allows TFETs to operate at lower voltages than conventional CMOS. On top of that, reducing the size of the gate does not hinder anything here. In order to avoid excessive tunneling, you just need to lower the voltage even more, which also leads to less heat generation. So, is it a victory? Alas, not everything is so simple. First, graphene that's needed for the production of tunnel effect transistors is the only element that has the necessary properties. Second, such transistors require ultra-low temperatures for operation, and water cooling is not enough here. Liquid nitrogen is a prerequisite. Thus, scientists still need to do a lot of research before we can see first devices based on TFETs. And since we are moving away from the classic CMOS transistors, let us also mention memristors. Memristors were developed on paper back in the 70s, and their name comes from the words memory and resistor. And this perfectly describes their main feature. A resistor is basically an electrical resistance that does not change in any way, whereas a memristor has a memory effect. In other words, it changes its conductivity according to the amount of electric charge flowing through it. This property allows a perfect memristor to be both volatile and non-volatile memory at once, that is, combined RAM and SSD. And it can turn our ideas about data storage upside down booting the system will no longer be necessary. After all, all the information from the RAM and the drive will be stored in one place. A power outage will no longer lead to loss of information. The memristor, being non-volatile, will retain the last state. Downloading any data will speed up significantly. After all, you no longer need to move information between RAM and the drive. Sounds like fiction, huh? Yeah, but this is already a reality. The Israeli company WeBit Nano announced the successful completion of testing of a RISC-V modular architecture SoC with 128 kilobytes of built-in resistive memory RERAM. Such memory is less susceptible to temperature fluctuations, radiation, and other negative factors, which makes it attractive for the industrial and military application. And, if we look into the more distant future, memristors are ideally suited for the role of artificial synapses to create neural networks as similar as possible to the human brain. And it can be designed on standard microchip equipment. The thing is, a memristor behaves in a very similar way to a synapse. The larger is the signal that passes through it, the better it will pass the signal in the future. This property is ideal for teaching terminators to adapt to us as realistically as possible. So, we have considered two approaches, replacing silicon with other elements and changing the principle of operation of transistors. What else can be changed? For instance, the charge in data carriers themselves, electrons, in some cases can be perfectly well replaced by photons. Many have heard, or even are using now, the PON or GPON technology, an optical network that is already actively replacing copper twisted pairs in large cities, allowing millions of users to get fast internet access. A similar technology can also be used in computers. It is more efficient to transmit information using light, since it allows you to get a wider bandwidth, immunity to electrical interference, and minimal heating. Theoretically, optical connections will help reduce latency and increase the speed of interaction between the processor's compute units and the cache, or between the processor itself and RAM. We can already see the limitations of copper conductors in practice. Only the first PCIe slots of the new Intel processors support the new 5.0 protocol, and the GDDR6X chips have to be placed as close to the GPU as possible. Photonics will remove all these limitations, which will allow computers to develop further. Although it must be said that this does not solve the problem of the physical limitations of silicon. 
The only thing that's left is to tell you about the most popular and the latest possible approach, which no longer changes physics itself, but the entire logic of computer operation. The vast majority of various electronics is centered around ones and zeros, the presence and absence of electric charge. It is this basic principle that allows transistors to calculate and the memory cells to store information. But the simplest is not always the best. This approach imposes serious limitations on many tasks. These limitations are easily bypassed by quantum computers. The spoon does not exist for them. There are no clear ones and zeros. They operate with qubits or quantum bits that have a state of zero and one simultaneously. But how is this possible? Here's a simple example. How many numbers are there made up of two zeros or ones? Obviously, there are four. These are 00, 01, 10, and 11. You need two bits to store each one, which gives us a total of eight bits. And you need only two qubits for that. That is four times less. The most important thing is that the more complex tasks we solve, the greater the profit from using quantum bits. Imagine that we need to brute force a password. An ordinary computer will sort through all possible combinations. But a quantum computer does not need that. It is enough for it to take as many qubits as necessary to store the largest possible password. And the task will be solved. Such a number of qubits will already contain all possible passwords, including the one that we are looking for. Yes, this approach is mind-blowing. In fact, everything is even more complicated than that, for you can't just simply obtain the results of quantum calculations, since the system is in an arbitrary state at every moment in time, and an attempt to read the data will turn it into a classical one. But we are here now not to talk about the operation principles of quantum computers, this is a whole different topic in itself. We are talking about whether they are the future of complex computing. And the answer is yes. The simplest quantum computers can already be bought. And the price can be quite affordable and even lower than that of the top tier Apple Mac Pro. A year ago, the Chinese startup Shenzhen Spink Technology demonstrated a supercomputer with two qubits at a price of only $5,000. The low price is due to both a small number of qubits and a fairly simple principle of operation based on nuclear magnetic resonance, which has already been well studied. Also, they are using ordinary permanent magnets instead of superconducting ones, although still quite powerful. By the way, the whole thing is controlled from a regular PC, to which the spink can be connected. And this, of course, is just the beginning. Just a few months after the Chinese, the Dutch startup Quantware presented its 5 qubit computer. True, its price was not announced, but the idea here is quite clear. Quantum computers are becoming more and more popular and appear in the masses. So it is quite possible that they are the future of personal electronic devices after all. Thus, no need to worry about it now. Yes, we are getting close to the silicon limitations, but it's not the only thing we've got. There are enough various elements that can replace it. We can even change the operation principle of transistors, or even the very logic of computers. Thus, technological progress cannot be stopped. Electronics will continue to develop, but in what direction? Only future will tell. That is, if it continues to exist for us in this line of events. If you want to cross paths more often, click on the subscribe button, give us a like if you enjoyed the video, dislike if not, nobody's gonna see it anyway. My name is Mikhail Krashen, the communication session is over, bye.